Dowd on McPherson. I'm, of course, speaking about Guy McPherson. And no, this is not his tombstone. I'll explain at the end of this why I use this shot. It's a high compliment, even though that would be a surprise to most people, I think. I'm Michael Dowd, and I'm recording this in July of 2022. Questions that I'm often asked when, with respect to Guy McPherson is why haven't you had a post-doom conversation with Guy? And where do you agree or disagree with McPherson? And then what's your history with Guy McPherson and what do you honestly think of him? And I've gotten this last question quite a bit since March because Guy posted this nine minute and 43 second video that the time codes between 4.30 and six, he names a couple of dozen of us, including me, as uh, part of a government conspiracy to defame him, which is not true with respect to me. I don't know about the others, but uh, this is not a retaliation video. In fact, it's quite the opposite. I'm probably best known for my post-Doom work. You can read, I've also written a couple of books, including one of them that got six Nobel Prize winning scientists that endorsed it and about 100 other religious and science leaders. I've had 85 post-Doom conversations. I've done two TEDx talks. And then my resources page is the best thing on the internet that I'm aware of in terms of Doom, post-Doom, collapse, overshoot, uh, the rise and fall of civilizations and so forth. There's just tons of stuff there. So if you only watch just a couple minutes of this video, here's basically the essence of what I'm trying to say. The end is nigh. Well, there was a time I would have dismissed him as a crank. I see Guy McPherson as a modern day prophet. That is one who speaks on behalf of reality with clarity and courage. No, there's nothing otherworldly or supernatural. A prophet's message is often so unwelcome that their livelihood and their very life may be at risk for simply telling truths that no one else sees or has a chutzpah to voice publicly, which is why the powers that be often try to silence and discredit them. I love this quote from Meryl Streep, President Janie Orlean in the movie, Don't Look Up. You cannot go around saying to people that there's a 100% chance they're gonna die. You know, it's just nuts. Well, that's the situation. And it's one of the reasons why Rodney Dangerfield got a lot more respect than Guy McPherson does. In precisely for that reason. So I deeply honor Guy McPherson for the courageously and tirelessly popularizing the most repulsive scientific knowledge in human history. And at the end of this video, also in the YouTube description box, are links to my favorite McPherson videos, posts, and papers. So another recent video that I did that I really love is Hopium Detox and Recovery, Accepting and Trusting unstoppable collapse. And another one that I'll be uploading this week is Hopium Dealers Hall of Fame with a nod to Guy McPherson. So Hopium Detox and Recovery, Guy McPherson has done the best work on that. His Nature Bats last uh, podcast and, and blog and everything else at guymcpherson.com. His two books, Going Dark and Only Love Remains, Dancing at the Edge of Extinction are both textbooks in Hopium Detox and recovery. Now, what do I mean by hopium? Hopium is a comforting vision of the future that requires breaking the laws of physics, biology, or ecology. Hopium is also addiction to false, literally impossible hopes. And hopium is irrational or unwarranted optimism that promises short-term relief, but delivers crushing disappointment and despair when reality inevitably bites. These are all hopium, renewables, nuclear, wind and solar, fusion, space colonization, electric cars, green economy, carbon sequestration, biofuels, carbon taxation and credits, super batteries. These are all hopium because they extend and exacerbate ecological overshoot, which is our real issue, not climate. That's just a symptom of ecological overshoot. So we are already two to three decades into abrupt runaway and exponentially accelerating climate mayhem. And don't take my word on it or Guy McPherson's for that matter, here's the science. These are all the cops, the conference of the parties, all of our agreements and pledges. Turns out that our summits, agreements, promises and pledges are worse than meaningless because they give us the delusion that we're making progress when the opposite is the case. In the 1960s, carbon was growing at 0.9 parts per million per year. In the 1970s, 1.3 parts per million per year. 
In the 80s and 90s, one and a half parts per million per year. In the 2000s, 2.0 parts per million. In the 2010s, 2.4, and it's already up to 2.6 parts per million per year. And I'm recording this in 2022. And that's just the CO2. If you look at the methane and carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide combined, what's sometimes called CO2 equivalent, it's actually over 500 parts per million already. So this is what I mean by unstoppable collapse. It's what Guy McPherson also means by unstoppable collapse. Because no matter what, these extinction level tipping points are already in the rear view mirror. The loss of the world's ice, the Arctic, Greenland, West Antarctica, turns out East Antarctica too, the mountain glaciers. When most of the Arctic sea ice is gone, the serious global warming begins. And I'm not going to go into details in this video, but learn about phase change and latent heat. You can Google it. Methane belching. This is unstoppable from the permafrost, from the uh, shallow and deep hydrates and clathrates, tropical wetlands. A, a paper in Science just came out just a few days ago on this topic that's already in runaway mode. And of course, our oil and gas wells that are leaking tons of it. Ocean acidification and deoxygenation, and at least 25 feet of abrupt nonlinear, that's fits and starts, sea level rise. If all humans went extinct tonight, we'd have at least 25 to 40 feet of sea level rise. It's unstoppable. And it, again, it's not me saying that. I Just a few days ago, I talked with John Englander, the uh, former, uh, I think he was CEO of the Jacques Cousteau Society, and he wrote one of the best books called High Tide on Main Street, where he talks about this. The great conflagration, that is the great burning of the world's forests are already in runaway, unstoppable, out of control mode. And this is not just CO2. If every human went extinct tonight, if some virus wiped us out tonight, Carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide would continue to rise. It doesn't matter if we reduce our emissions. I mean, it matters to us in terms of helping us feel good about ourselves, but it ain't going to happen, and it doesn't need to happen because this is already in runaway mode. The world's forests, bigger forest fires, more intense forest fires, more forest fires around the world. It's in unstoppable mode, which means the loss of most species, animal and plant, on land and in lakes, rivers and oceans, and increasingly severe and deadly weather, storms, floods, droughts, hurricanes, all of these are unstoppable. They're in runaway mode. If every human being died tonight, these would still continue. And if every human being woke up tomorrow was an eco saint committed to doing the right thing, these would still continue. And Guy McPherson's got the best stuff on the, in the whole internet. His climate change summary summarizes dozens of tipping points, that is self-reinforcing feedback loops that are already in unstoppable runaway mode. And he hasn't even updated this in five years. It's still the best thing out there. This is another point that Guy McPherson regularly makes. There are 440 nuclear reactors worldwide requiring us to assume that industrial civilization has everlasting life. While we're already 25 to 30 years into abrupt runaway climate change. So here's my question. I call it the 64 million year question, not, not 64 million dollar question, for those of you that know what that means. It's the 64 million year question. As industrial civilization continues to collapse faster and faster, how many Chernobyl or Fukushima-like or worse meltdowns due to wildfires, hurricanes, droughts, tsunamis, power grid failures, political instability or terrorism do you think are possible, likely, inevitable? So coming to these questions, why haven't I had a post-doom conversation with Guy McPherson? Well, first of all, what do I mean by post-doom? So I've had 85 conversations with literally the top people in the world who get the big picture, including the scariest of the scary stuff, and then move through the grief work in order to be a blessing and a contribution to others and not be in freakout mode. And obviously, Guy McPherson was one of the first people I asked, but these are the people that I've actually interviewed. Now, many of these people, probably two dozen of them, I've talked to about Guy McPherson, and it's always been positive. I've never had any conversation with any of these people where we either trashed him or spoke bad about him. Some of these people used to have a closer relationship to, to him than they do now for a variety of reasons that, frankly, I don't give a damn about. But these people, especially Kevin Hester, has done a tremendous amount to work with Guy McPherson. 
they co-hosted the Nature Bats last podcast for several years. But again, these are people who get the big picture. Most of these people stand on the shoulders of Guy McPherson, although some of them wouldn't admit it because they don't have a good relationship with him for a variety of reasons. But Beryl also has had a tremendous positive role in furthering uh, the work of Guy McPherson. So I extended over a two year period, I extended three post-doom conversation invitations to Guy. And each time he clearly and politely declined. In June of 2019, he replied, thank you for the invitation. However, I will not participate in a conversation involving people who defame me. Your list includes several, sincerely Guy. I say this to my embarrassment, I had to look up the word defame. I didn't know what he, what he meant. And then in December of 2019, so six months later, he says, I count at least 20 people who have betrayed, plagiarized, or defamed me. No thanks. And that was on the list of the people I was anticipating. Uh, so I, I didn't know what he meant. I didn't pursue it. But then in January of 2021, so a year and, and a month later, he says, Michael, I suspect you continue to defame me overtly or subtly. I suspect you continue to downplay the importance of the aerosol masking effect. I assume you continue to deny the relevance of nuclear power plants melting down. Therefore, I will not participate in a call of any kind with you. I do not wish to risk further defamation. You have done too much of that already. Well, at that point, <laughs> I'd had like two dozen email exchanges with Guy over the years. And I, I challenged him. I said, dude, you're an evidence guy. You're an evidential guy. I suspect you continue to defame me. I suspect you downplay. I assume, and then you'd say you've done too much of that. Give me the evidence, show me anywhere. It can even be second or third hand. Like tell me who says that I've said anything negative about you like in the last decade. And he couldn't do it. He turned, he basically sent one email where I was <laughs> encouraging him to forgive some of these other people. And I said, guy, we're all assholes sometimes. And he assumed that that meant that I had been an asshole about him or towards him. And at that point I was like, okay, whatever. And then he came out with this in March of 2022, this year. And Chinese curse number two, may you attract the attention of the government, it's between 4.30 and six minutes on the time scale. Um, he names these people. And I'm third on the list of a list of people who are much more well-known and better writers than I am. And I know all these people are actually Michael Mann, I've never spoken with uh, personally, but I know the rest of them, I've talked with them never talked negative about Guy, but he warns, stay away from these disreputable people. And Guy claims that all of us and a dozen other colleagues and family members are part of a government plot to libel, slander, and plagiarize him. And this is a quote from him, a coordinated defamation campaign meant to destroy my public life. Now, when I first heard this or, or watched this, this video, I just like, what? You know, I just sort of, and I sent him an email that would cut and paste of all kinds of stuff and whatever, and he didn't respond. And to his credit, I mean, he's probably been so battered by, uh, I actually looked up, David, I, some of these people, I looked up, you know, put their name and Guy McPherson's name. And yeah, they've said some really, not all of these people, like, I mean, I honestly don't know, but several of them, some of the best known, um, have said some really unfair, unkind, and unprofessional things about Guy, and sometimes in print, like David Wallace Wells and Royce Granton. So I have no doubt that there are people who have basically said bad things or trashy things about Guy McPherson. I don't happen to be one of them, and I didn't research all these people. But what I do know is that anybody who genuinely doesn't know that by naming people's names and then saying to your, all your followers, stay away from these disreputable people as if their entire body of work could be uh, trashed because they said something bad about me. Uh, anybody who doesn't know that it deserves my compassion, not my derision. Fortunately, in June, a month and a half later, guy came out, or two and a half months later, guy came out with this, uh, the three purported Chinese curses, which basically is the same text as that, but he, he eliminated all the names other than a, a couple. So, and then just literally a few weeks ago, he said, I'm done. And in watching both of these a couple of times, 
I was actually filled with compassion because the truth of the matter is I can't imagine anybody who has had a bigger target on his back. Um, who's, you know, uh, th that old phrase, uh, well, one of his friends said, I, I think guy may suffer from persecution paranoia. He said, I just, I'm just making that up. And that may be, but my sense is that if I was Guy, given his genes, history, and beliefs, I'd be just like him. I just assume that towards everybody. So if I had to deal with, he had to deal with, I'd probably suffer from persecution paranoia too. So it's like, most likely, I think, actual persecution as well. The famous, don't shoot the messenger. Well, nobody has been shot at more, I think, than Guy McPherson because of the message he's carrying. Again, that quote from Janie Orlean, uh, Meryl Streep really says it. So for the record, no matter what Guy McPherson thinks of, he, thinks of me, if he never speaks to me again, or if he just hates this video, I'm enormously grateful to him for publicly giving voice in a multitude of ways to what the peer-reviewed scientific literature is saying, but no one wants to hear, and for faithfully and fearlessly popularizing the most unacceptable and repulsive, the most nauseating scientific knowledge in human history. I'm grateful to him for that, whatever he thinks of me. So next question, where do you align or agree and where do you diverge or disagree with McPherson? So here's the main places. Basically, we agree, as best I can tell, on virtually all the science. There's one place I think he's demonstrably wrong. It's pretty minor. But we both agree on abrupt, irreversible, that is unstoppable and catastrophic climate change. Dozens of tipping points are already passed, and yet the mainstream media and the IPCC claims like we're at risk of passing them. No, no. We ran over that dog or those dogs decades ago and yet they're being framed as still avoidable. Global dimming, the aerosol masking effect, the McPherson paradox, that is, that the paradox is that the only thing worse than industrial civilization continuing is industrial civilization rapidly stopping because of the aerosol masking effect. And I agree with them completely on that. The exponential rising rate of warming is its deadliest aspect. We are rising CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide at a faster rate than even the worst of the previous mass extinctions. The inevitability of uncontrollable, catastrophic nuclear meltdowns. I, I totally agree with them on that. And it may be unstoppable already. I mean, part of my effort is to try to at least get enough people through and enough leaders through hopium detox and recovery that we might be able to take some of the spent fuel rods out of the swimming pools into someplace like Yucca Mountain, but I'm not confident that that's gonna be done. And so we're gonna have at least a dozen, maybe hundreds of catastrophic nuclear meltdowns. The imminent loss for habitat for most surface life on earth. Now here's where I think Guy McPherson is wrong because he says loss of all life on earth and he's basing this on other scholarship of course, but even the scholarship that he's basing on basically they're surface chauvinists. Tommy Gold, who's the guy who hired Carl Sagan at Cornell, uh, one of the top scientists of the 21st century or the 20th century, um, he wrote a book called The Deep Hot Biosphere that turns out my wife Connie actually ghost wrote or lived with him and co-wrote, but her name isn't on the, uh, on the book. And he, what they talk about, what Tommy Gold basically proved, is that there's more life under the ground than on the surface. That's what he means by surface chauvinism. We surface dwelling animals think that all the cool important life's up here. No, it's not. So again, this is based on his PNAS paper uh, back in July of 1992. And there was a recent update, the deep hot biosphere, 25 years of retrospection. So no, it's not all life on earth, but it is probably most surface life on earth, the loss of habitat and extinction. The very strong likelihood of functional, if not complete near term human extinction. Functional extinction means there might be a few isolated pockets of humans somewhere in the world. We can't know that there won't be, but the likelihood is pretty slim, especially when you look at the nuclear um, and, and uh, the, uh, the, the McPherson paradox, the, the global dimming. Those two factors, the likelihood of there being any humans at all 30 years from now is, is really, really slim. But near term, homo colossus, which is William Catton's term for industrial humanity, where each of us in the industrial world uses 30 to 50 times the resources and exudes 30 to 50 times the waste. 
Homo colossus is destined for very near-term extinction. That may or may not mean the extinction of Homo sapiens, but it probably does. Anthropocentrism, that is human-centeredness, is inherently self-destructive and ecocidal. I actually wasn't sure whether Guy agreed with this. I thought he probably did. But then just uh, two weeks ago, I listened to the audio recording of his and Pauline's love story called Ms. Ladybug and Mr. Honeybee, a love story at the end of time. And it's really sweet. I also bought the book. Um, it's a sweet read. And yes, clearly they get that human centeredness is the problem. And then finally, living life fully and loving the life you live, especially at Teotihuacan, that is the end of the world as we know it. It may or may not be the end of the world full stop, probably is, but certainly it's the end of the world as we know it. And that's already the case. It's already unstoppable. Or in Guy and Pauline's words, our days are numbered. Passionately pursue a life of excellence. And they also say at the edge of extinction, only love remains. So here are the places where Guy and I, I think, I could be wrong, uh, diverge or disagree. First of all, nature, how we speak about our biophysical creator, sustainer, and end. Uh, now, Nature Bat's last podcast, the theme song was created by Afrizen. Now, to his credit, Guy didn't create the song, so I don't know how perfectly he aligns with the lyrics. But, you know, Mother Nature, she's going to get you. She's grown to hate you. She bats last and she's coming out swinging. She's had all that she can take. Now it's payback time, motherfuckers, it's payback time. And I've seen Guy singing, you know, robustly this. And so he must align with it to some degree. And certainly this is a, a, a pretty pathetic understanding of our biophysical creator and sustainer and end, even if it's completely metaphorical. I mean, I get he's probably doing it just humorously, but my understanding is much more along these lines. World as lover, world as self. Joanna Macy is one of my top mentors in her latest book, A Wild Love for the World and the Work of Our Time. Her work is the work that reconnects. And here's a great quote. This is a dark time filled with suffering and uncertainty. Like living cells in a larger body, it is natural that we feel the trauma of our world. So don't be afraid of the anguish you feel or the anger or fear, because these responses arise from the depth of your caring and the truth of your interconnectedness with all beings. So I'm not going to go into more of the sort of eco-theological, because I'm an eco-theologian, so I'm not going to bother going into all that. These two long videos Sustainability 101, indigenuity is not optional. And God, G, Earth emoji, D, because any concept of God that doesn't include the biosphere is a ecocidal notion of the divine. So God owning our error, accepting our fate. And then my two very short videos, my God, what have we done? Which uh, is what was said after we dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, the co-pilot said that. And then true sustainability. A uh, little sh short sermon, cultivating a repentant, pro-future heart and mind. So, at any rate, if you're interested in my take on this, but at any rate, suffice it to say, I think Guy and I disagree on how we speak about our biophysical creator, sustainer, and end. And the mirror reflection framework, he's been uh, promoting this a lot lately, Dr. Ye Tao at Harvard University. Now, I was on a seminar, a webinar with uh, Dr. Tao, and he's an amazing guy. He's a Brilliant, big hearted, just wonderful man, as best I can tell. But he still falls victim to an understanding of technology that's out of touch with reality. Joe Tainter, Joseph Tainter, his famous book, The Collapse of Com Complex Societies, talks about the reason complex societies fail, the major reason, is they create technology and complexity. And at some point, the technology and complexity don't solve problems, they create more problems, and then the society collapses. And then this book, Technofix, Why Technology Won't Save Us or the Environment. It's got like, you know, 60 or 70 endorsers, like a who's who of endorsers in the first few pages. But here are the main points. That human technology that doesn't integrate with life's technology, nature's technology, God, Earth Emoji, D's technology, does more harm than good. It just does it over time. 
Technology in the context of ongoing economic growth does not promote sustainability, but hastens collapse. Most technological solutions to social and technology created problems are counterproductive. And this book shows why new technologies tend to be uncritically accepted, who really controls the direction of change, and why technology expands and accelerates ecocide. So I think we disagree on the biophysical creator sustainer and how we relate to that. For me, if we don't relate to the biosphere as like it's God, as if it's God, like as a greater thou, not a lesser it, we're, we're, we're sunk. And whether extractive, energy intensive, and polluting technology of any kind is viable. And that's where we disagree on the mirror reflection project. So love, its meaning, applications, and usual evidential expression. Now, on one of my videos on YouTube, somebody wrote this comment, and it, it broke my heart. Only love remains. Now, quit asking me stupid questions, you moron. Some guy. Now, clearly, he was referring to Guy McPherson, and this is the way some people have said that they've experienced Guy. I have not experienced this. He has never been not polite to me or disrespectful to me. All my interactions with him, even when he was you know, basically saying he thought that I defamed him, he was, he was respectful. So that's not been my experience. But I do know that to use the word love, you got to have some evidence behind it. So as <laughs> no less authority than Fred Rogers, Love isn't a state of perfect caring. It's an active noun, like struggle. To love someone is to strive to accept that person exactly the way he or she is right here and right now. And my way of saying it is that love is accepting others exactly as they are and exactly as they're not and sincerely wanting the best for them. That's really the essence of love, accepting others exactly as they are and exactly as they're not and sincerely wanting the best for them. So... I like this quote, maybe it's because I come out of the Christian tradition, I'm a Christian naturalist, I'm a, a religious naturalist, but I still like this quote from 1 Corinthians. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not dishonor others, it is not easily angered. Love keeps no record of wrongs. And it seems to me these three pillars, respect and empathy, being responsible rather than blaming, and being gen generous rather than stingy, these are the three fundamental pillars of, ex of evidential expression of love. If these things aren't present, then somebody may be using the word love, but uh, may not be as grounded as, as it could be. So I'm not going to go into more on this, but I, I think that uh, love's meaning applications and usual evidential expression shows up in our relationships. And so this is another place where I think Guy and I differ. Um, for me, everything it revolves around having the best possible relationship with family, friends, colleagues, former intimates, and so forth. It seems to me that in mature, healthy, neurotypical individuals, love is generally evidenced by having high quality relationships with family, friends, spouse, partner, former spouses or partners, former lovers, former intimates, colleagues, adversaries, and so forth. And I'm not judging Guy for not having these values. He gets to have, live his life however he wants. But certainly, I think we understand relationships and love in a different way. And then finally, grief, recovering from it versus ritualizing and cherishing grief as a gift. I think this is another place we differ. Uh, Guy and Pauline promote and highly recommend John James and Russell Friedman's work, The Grief Recovery Handbook. And I've both purchased the book and the audiobook, and I agree, it's excellent. This is a quote, no one likes to feel sad, so they do what most people are taught. They pretend that they're okay. So I, I also recommend this, but there are other approaches to grief that are equally, uh, or maybe for me at least, more helpful. Stephen Jenkinson, his documentary Grief Walker, which I highly recommend, is the best thing I've ever seen on death uh, online. Uh, you can watch it for free. And his book, Die Wise. And I love this quote, not success, not growth, not happiness. The cradle of your love of life is death. Again, this is why I'm grateful to Guy McPherson. He's reminding our species of our mortality. Stephen Jenkinson also has this great quote. I call it hope-free sweet grief, which is grateful, loving sadness that's neither hopeful nor hopeless. He says, grief requires us to know the time we're in. The great enemy of grief is hope. 
Hope is the four letter word for people who are unwilling to know things for what they are. Our time requires us to be hope free, to burn through the false choice of being hopeful or hopeless. They're two sides of the same con job. Grief is required to proceed. Now, I don't know if Guy got the term hope free from Stephen Jenkinson or vice versa. It's possible that Stephen Jenkinson got the term from Guy McPherson. But in any case, one of the papers that Guy has written is called Becoming Hope Free, Parallels Between Death of Individuals and the Extinction of Homo Sapiens. And uh, again, you can Google it and find it. I highly recommend it. It's short, it's great. And I've recorded the whole thing um, with his permission, uh, Becoming Hope Free. And so you, if you just Google SoundCloud, Becoming Hope Free, you'll get there. So again, just to summarize where Guy McPherson and I agree or align is virtually all the science. And where Guy and I differ or diverge is some of the relational stuff. Finally, I'm asked, what's your history with Guy? And what do you honestly think of him? Well, what I honestly think of him is that he's doing the best he can given what he's got to work with, just as I am and you are and everybody we know and love is. That if I had your genes, history, and beliefs, I'd be just like you. If I had guys, same thing. And so I think that's true for all of us. So that's what I honestly think of them. And this Paul Trafurka is an amazing colleague. I just love this brother. Five stages of awakening, climbing the ladder of awareness. Um, Google climbing the ladder of awareness. It's a, it's a great read. I've also audio recorded that uh, on SoundCloud. But here's the, here's the nutshell. Dead asleep. Awareness of one fundamental problem, awareness of many problems, awareness of the interconnections between the many problems, and awareness that our predicament encompasses all aspects of life. This maps my trajectory exactly. Uh, I had an ecological understanding. Thomas Berry became my mentor in 1988. Joanna Macy and all the deep ecologists and bioregionalists and permaculturists, uh, all from the late 1980s, but then in the year 2000, I read several books that put me on a techno-optimist bandwagon. In fact, my own book, uh, Thank God for Revolution, that was the one that was endorsed by all these Nobel Prize winning scientists and stuff. I don't recommend it. 90% of it I still agree with, but the 10% that's hopium is horrible. Uh, so <laughs> no, I don't even recommend my own book. So I was dead asleep when I wrote that book in 2007. Awareness of one fundamental problem that came on December 3rd of 2012 when I watched David Roberts' TEDx talk, Climate Change is Simple, the remix, Ryan Cooper added some music. It is so powerful. It, for me, it was life-changingly powerful. In 2013, I started spending 20, 30, 40, 50 hours a week studying this stuff, and I became aware of many problems. It was bigger than just climate change. In 2014, I became aware of the interconnections between the many problems, and that was also my activist phase. Connie and I were massively involved in activism during that time. And then awareness of our predicament encompasses all aspects of life when I read William Catton's book, Overshoot, at the end of January of 2015. And in 2013 and a little bit of 2014 too, I ignorantly dismissed Guy McPherson and dismissed the idea of near-term human extinction. But then after spending years studying this stuff, now 12,000 hours and nine years of reading and audio recording, dozens of books and hundreds of articles, it's all up on SoundCloud, um, on abrupt climate change, ecological overshoot, the rise and fall of civilizations, and how to adapt and thrive in times of collapse, in times of fall, uh, I've come now to, uh, to, to shift profoundly. In February of 2015, Guy and Mike Sliwa interviewed me on their Nature Bats last podcast, um, and then in 2015, I really shifted from I hope Guy McPherson is wrong to where I am now. McPherson is a modern day prophet. And again, I'm not speaking prophet as anything otherworldly or supernatural. I'm a prophet as someone who sees what's real and what's emerging and speaks a word of warning to the people. Um, this is what's real, folks, uh, whether we like it or not. And that's what Guy McPherson has been doing. So it was a profound shift in 2015, and it's been ongoing a profound life-changing shift from collapse awareness to collapse acceptance, and then finally to collapse trust. 
And I love this. Back in 2015, uh, Bill Nye, the science guy, and Arnold Schwarzenegger teamed up and created this with National Geographic, Bill Nye's Global Meltdown. And there's this wonderful uh, section where Bill Nye goes and visits Guy McPherson. And then, you know, they're drinking and then, and then it shows Bill Nye walking, you know, drunk up the thing. It's just classic. These guys, uh, Schwarzenegger and Bill Nye had way too much fun. It's so funny and it's powerful, even though it's got a little hopium in there at the end. But in any case, I highly recommend this. And it, and it features Guy in a really positive way, as it should. Again, as I mentioned, my resources page is the best resources on the internet in terms of all of this stuff. And one of the things I have is this, abrupt climate mayhem, tipping points. And I talk about this in some of my other programs. And the truth is that all of us, everybody significant that's contributing on this issue owes a debt of gratitude, whether they voice it or not, to Guy McPherson. We all stand on his shoulders. And so his path to extinction is a fabulous one hour overview, which I highly recommend. Again, it's at guymcpherson.com. And his tagline is our days are numbered, passionately pursue a life of excellence. He's not about giving up. I highly recommend his science updates. They're all fabulous. And he's just usually just popularizing the, the message of the peer reviewed literature, other, other scientists work. His science snippets are consistently excellent. Um, I actually took this course. It's an audio course. It's a short course. You know, it's only 30 bucks, but it's excellent. It's a short audio course on conservation biology. And Pauline, his partner, she created a documentary based on his first book, Growing, Going Dark. It's a document, documentary about near-term human extinction. And I recommend that. It's excellent. Watched it a couple of times. And Guy and Pauline have a Only Love Remains workshop that they do. It's workshops, uh, and you can find more on onlyloveremains.org. That's the only thing I can't speak with experience to because I've not experienced it. But Kevin Hester, my post-Doom conversation with Kevin Hester was one of my favorites. He worked very closely and still is a close friend of Guy and Pauline. Um, his website, kevinhester.live, is chock full of all kinds of stuff. I mean, <laughs> in terms of hopium detox and recovery, GuyMcPherson.com and KevinHester.live, you can't do better than just spend several days there. And their Nature Bats last podcast, which is no longer ongoing, but personally, I fast forward after, you know, the first three minutes because that Nature Bats last, you know, Mother Nature song, uh, I, I just can't stomach it, but that's my taste. Beryl is another. She's an, a young woman, a scientist, brilliant scientist. My post in conversation with her, and she's also done a tremendous amount to further Guy McPherson's work. She just recently teamed up with William uh, Kalfels. He, uh, both of them have been involved in my post doom conversations. And um, um, Beryl has interviewed one of my closest colleagues, uh, Karen Perry, um, and also has done, as I said, a lot to further Guy McPherson's work. So I recommend Beryl and William's uh, YouTube channel. And actually Beryl co-authored co a paper, a scientific paper with Guy, just came out in March, Environmental Thresholds for Mass Extinction Events. Here are my favorite Guy McPherson videos, peer-reviewed papers, because he's really prolific, both in terms of what he writes and what he says and videos and everything else. So here's like my best hits, <laughs> my sense of what the best of the best of Guy McPherson. So Paths to Extinction, The Edge of Extinction, Maybe I'm Wrong, and May and Might Become Is. And all of these will also be in the, uh, the YouTube description box with the hot links how we go extinct, why we go extinct, when we go extinct, what will go extinct. Seven threes, the loss of aerosol masking and aerosol masking previously underestimated. These are essential for understanding the nature of reality now and what's unstoppable. Means of extinction, nuclear facilities implode. Arctic ocean warming, losing ice, video and supporting articles there. Earth is in the midst of abrupt, irreversible climate change. Science snippets, the ninth probably, and final species of human. And then his two longer pieces, which are absolutely chock full of resources and references. Extinction foretold, extinction ignored, and his massive climate change summary that even though it hasn't been updated in five years, it's still great and very relevant. So these are my favorite. 
So coming back to why did I, uh, I actually alienated some colleagues because they thought I was going to be trashing them, uh, which understandable, you know, given the fact that they knew about guys labeling me as somebody who's defamed him. Um, but tombstones and uh, it turns out cemeteries are one of my favorite places. Connie and I, this is a cemetery very close to us. We'd go there all the time. We'd walk there. My father got remarried, his second wife, in a cemetery. Okay, so it's, it's a family weirdness. Uh, if I were to do a video on Michael Shaw, uh, it wouldn't be because I'm meaning anything negative towards him. It's because his work, his video, his documentary, Living in the Time of Dying, is the best documentary in terms of reminding us of our mortality, our collective mortality. And if I were to do a video on Doubt on Barlow, my wife, Connie Barlow, this is actually an ancestor of hers, um, it wouldn't be because I'm trying to trash her. It's because she's got the best resources on the internet in terms of death as natural, generative, and no less sacred than life. All kinds of stories and games and just tons of stuff. So if love is accepting others exactly as they are and exactly as they're not and sincerely wanting the best for them, well, obviously I love my wife, Connie, but I also love Michael Shaw and I also love Guy McPherson because he has done more to bring our species mortality front and center than anybody else. And I deeply honor him for that. Again, GuyMcPherson.com. Thank you.